Let me hit record. Okay, Sean's power hour. And Vern is your horse? Yes. Okay. And Vern looks like a Percheron or draft cross? <laughs> yep, he's a full Percheron. Okay. Okay, so let's start with anything that brought you here today. Like, what is it that you're hoping to get some help with or what's going on? Yeah, so I bought Vern a year and a half ago. Um, I had been riding him three months prior to purchasing him. He's um, 22 years old or will be um, next month or in a couple weeks here. And when I started riding him, he was um, tripping quite a bit. And, um, it, you know, a lot of it was my naiveness, I guess, just Vern's my first horse. Okay. So, you know, I just kind of took it under, you know, that people just say, oh, he's just kind of clumsy or, um, you know, he, he's so big or, you know, his feet are so big or whatever. So, but come to find out, um, he did have EPM or has EPM. And he was diagnosed so, with that. Yeah. So okay. he was diagnosed. It was, um, July of last year that I think I, I got finalized testing because okay. he would come up, he would come up lame and in different feet, um, you know, different hooves. And it was just kind of, he would have this excessive tripping, um, you know, really he didn't, he had a swag to his walk. Um, and you can probably see that in the yeah. video. Like I a Marilyn, noticed. the Marilyn Monroe yes. hip swing. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yep. So he's got some hip swing to him. Yeah. Um, and so really let me, I'm let me ask you real quick. Um, the, the EPM testing has become quite good in recent mm -hmm. years. So did they do the tighter where they actually got kind of a load count? Yes. Okay. And so, then did you put him on the medicine and did his load reduce? Yeah, so he, I put him, so he was 4,000, which was significant. Very, yeah, very. Yeah. Um. So I, you know, according to the vet, that was pretty much the max of what he'd seen. Um. So we put him on the protozil, mm -hmm. uh, and I did two rounds of that. And then I also put him on um, natural vitamin E at that time. Mm -hmm. I think it was 10,000. I use for mm -hmm. that. Um, so a considerable dose for him and then also a dexamethasone taper for that. And he did really improve um, after the two rounds. They didn't retest at that point um, because I, you know, when I talked with the vet, he had made his improvements, things were going well. And then um he, he really was doing, you know, I was doing rehab at that time with him, just kind of a lot of um, pole work and um, hand lunging, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then I wasn't riding him at all. And then um, he was actually really good with tripping for about four months. And then now, most recently, like I would say about a month and a half, ago he kind of started doing the tripping again and then I had a pretty significant fall with him um at a you, canner you fell yeah. off or he fell uh, well he fell and I fell off of him because like a big was, stumble did he go down or just on his knees and then recover no he he went all the way down so I'm used oh. to him going down to his knee so he's said he's so big um that I'm usually able to catch myself on his neck um when he goes down to his knees we were at a canner and he really just it, it, his he just completely lost his whole front end um so when he went down um, I just went right over the top of him. So actually Vicky, Vicky was there, um, and kind of saw the whole thing too. Oh, so, yikes. Yeah. That was my last canner on him <laughs> since then. Anyway, not that I'm scared. I just, I want to be safe for him and for me. Well, um, you have something going on with how he's using himself. So his posture under saddle is really working against his overall stability mm -hmm. and coupled with the EPM. 
Um, and it, it, have you ever rechecked him after the two rounds of the protozil? So I'm the vet's coming out um, in two weeks. So okay, I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to do follow up. And then um, I actually did an aggressive round or rounds of the worming. So um, just to kind of rule anything else out. Um, and then I did put them on immune biome, the, the spine and nerve, mm -hmm. um, hoping that might just help things. And then um, he's still on the vitamin E. So yeah. he's on 8,000 for the vitamin E daily. So yeah, so I would do all of that that you're doing. And with that high of a load, I would probably just plan to get him tested once a year until those numbers like because you're doing it now if the numbers mm -hmm. look good and they're way reduced and you don't have to put them through another round of protozil and i would keep them on the vitamin e absolutely mm -hmm. like you're doing yeah. um yeah. but if after this checkup if he has to go back on the protozil then i would definitely just test him like maybe six months if he's stumbling or a year if he's doing pretty good and mm -hmm. just kind of keep an eye on that so you don't let okay. him spike again because it is mm -hmm. that is one of the most dangerous things is if you add speed they literally lose control over their hindquarters and you know falling down a, a, at canter or even at trot is not um unheard of so mm -hmm. that's why you kind of want to keep an eye on the numbers. But what I can help you with is starting to get him to move differently, which will yeah. also, I'll go over that. We'll look at the video really quick. But everything you're doing regarding the EPM with at least annual testing until he's really out of the woods, mm -hmm. um, I would just do that for your safety as well sure. as his well-being. But for your yeah. safety, just to sort of know what to push, what not to push regarding yeah. speed or performance, because it, it they can go down like that. And it's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And he's a big boy. So it's... he is a big boy. Yeah. Okay. So let me share the screen. And then are there any questions regarding this ride in particular? So there wasn't really, um, any questions about it I kind of know when he's riding hollow he does ride his head he carries his head high and I actually stopped using a bit with him because I thought it was really impacting how he was breathing um with riding um and some of that I thought was EPM related. So that's one thing I've changed. So here he's in a side pull and um, he does respond well to it, but he does have such a high head carriage and he kind of anticipates me um, when I was trying to work on transitions here mm -hmm. with him. Um, Can you and, see the screen okay? Yep. Yep. Okay, I'm going to hit play and I'm going to let it go through a couple of times. We'll just kind of okay. watch it because it's a short video. But if you can, sure. that's as big as I can make the video. I in, can see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you kind of go in and out of camera. So I'm just going to let it play yeah. through a couple of times while we're chit-chatting. Sure. Um, and so you're in a side pull with him. Mm-hmm. And, and you feel perfectly safe in the side pull. Yeah, I do. He's very, he responds really well off a of seat and legs. Like he, it's, um, you know, he really does have a lot of motivation and work ethic. Um, so I usually don't have any issues. Um, you know, he, he does want to please. He's a very, you know, he wants to please you when you're riding him too. So, um, He's usually pretty level-headed under the saddle. Good. Yeah, and that's what I see in the video you sent. And I just sped it up. For some reason, it's playing slow. It was at the one time. But okay. for some reason, it's kind of playing in slow motion, which isn't the worst thing for us to work with. Um, mm -hmm. And even when I speed it up to one and a quarter time, it still looks like slow, slow motion. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah. So, um 
it, what struck me was he looks like a very willing, very safe horse. Mm -hmm. Whenever I'm looking at a new horse and rider, the first question or the first thing that I'm looking at is, does the rider look like that's where the biggest adjustment would be helpful or is it, you know, more important that we address the horse's balance? And in your case, I think you're riding really well for what you're coping with regarding how he's moving, because the way he's moving is generating a whole lot of side to side force. And, and also, you can feel it. Yeah. yeah, like a rocking of the whole barrel side to side, whether it's walk or trot. And mm -hmm. then tends to also make the transitions they'll they'll go slow fast slow fast or it'll be either really lethargic or really rushy and yeah. so those are kind of the three options so which one does he do back and forth or rush? He, you know sometimes when we're lunging when I'm just lunging free lunging him he is slow on his transitions and really kind of um just yeah just slow and and then but on him, yeah but on him he's fast to me it feels like because he's anticipating me he's already has a step ahead of me sometimes I feel like and then um so I don't know if it just depends like if he's not under saddle or if he is kind of thing that's I don't yeah know. and that's actually no that's really good information because when he's lethargic without the rider that's more the speed at which he can maintain his stability in his own body. When okay. we add the rider, right, it's, it's not the size and shape we are. All riders are weight and mass. And so as soon as you add a rider, because you're, you're well balanced, like you're coping, you're a good rider, and I'm not really going to address anything regarding you in this consult because you're doing a really good job with what you've got. The The challenge is really in the horse more than you for now, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So we're going right. to kind of look at some things with him. And the slow mm -hmm. speed, say, on the lunge line mm -hmm. is the speed at which he feels he can maintain his stability better. And it's oh. quite lethargic. So the difference is once we get on them and we've added a living weight and mass to the mm -hmm. equation, the other option of either losing forward or just having careful lethargic motion to find stability is using momentum to find stability. Okay. And so with you on him, he's choosing to go too fast rather than the speed at which he kind of feels he's stable. Okay. Does that make that sense? Makes sense. So yeah. horse, horses that rush are looking for stability. So I, mm -hmm. I tell people, it's like, if you watch an adult go down a steep hill and you watch a little kid go down a steep hill, the adults are like the lethargic <laughs> backstepping ones and the yeah. little kids are using momentum. Yeah. 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 And if you add like trot and canter power to that instability that he's showing by being too slow or too fast, then it is you could get a wipeout because mm -hmm. it's an they use momentum as a stabilizing force, but it's really not in their control. So it's okay. just a little kid running down the hill. The faster you go, the you know, you feel like, okay, if I go faster, 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 maybe I won't fall. But yeah. one, one wrong step and you're gonna take a header. You know, yes. and you're going to go tumbling. And yeah. so that's probably what happened to you at Cantor. Okay. Okay. So yeah. what I would recommend because of the EPM and because of um, the, the fall at Cantor, and if he's starting to trip again, just between now and when you get his numbers back, I would mm -hmm. stick to the walk, but focus on, let me see if this will play again, focus on changing how he carries himself okay so the high-headedness and this drives me nuts people will say a breed like a percheron or any draft just has what's called a high headset and so mm -hmm. they always go around the challenge with percherons or any drafts is the breed has a tendency to put on a lot of muscle easily and mm -hmm. so 
when a horse is out of balance, they tend to stabilize more on the front half of their body. They tighten the neck. They have too much weight on the front legs and they'll get tight around the shoulders and neck because the back and the hindquarter is not doing its ideal mechanical job. So ideally okay. every horse, they all have the same anatomy. So it works the same way, no matter the breed. Yeah. Every horse is meant to stabilize their body in forward motion through the the back, like the thoracolumbar spine and the pelvis. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So when they're out of balance, they're not controlling their own body weight very well. It's going excessively to the front end and they're having to stabilize through the front legs and the neck, which is not mechanically efficient or the okay. part, it's not the part of the body that's designed to do that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. So obviously the EPM played a big role in weakening the strength of his hindquarter. Mm-hmm and his back. Okay. So yeah. not only with addressing the EPM, but in the work, the only way he's truly using the back and the hindquarter correctly would be the antithesis of the posture that he's in. And I'll go into further explanation of why that is and how it works. But okay. as high headed as he is, I would encourage in any way, shape, or form, groundwork or riding, and we can go in a little bit how to do it. You need long and low. And he does. So this is um, because he has dressage background. Um, he does stretch a lot. So he will ride low. Good. Um, but then when I ask for like a trot in a low headset, he is all over. The, I have, I feel like I have no control. He doesn't. He so what you're like, just, he needs a support, you know, support or something. Cause he's just, uh, just a train wreck. He's so wobbly and doesn't know what to do. Yes. yes. So, and um, when they do that, like they may have a pretty good walk in long and low, and that's something you can work with to re-strengthen the hindquarters. If you have that at least at the walk and that's easy, that's fantastic because that you can really build on. When they have that at the walk, but they resort, they feel like what you're describing, kind of a hot mess all over the place, or they have to shorten and elevate the neck to give you a faster speed than the walk, the trot and the canter. What mm -hmm. you're really describing is a lack of strength. Okay. Right. So we want to look at this a couple different ways. And the way I train is the posture is sort of the gross indicator of how they're using their sort of skeleton, whether it's good coordination or bad coordination, something we want to encourage or discourage. So the, the overall posture of the horse is just it's not into the detail, but at least it's a good point of reference to start with. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anything you do, whether it's groundwork or under saddle, that's allowing him to be long and low, which is the opposite. It's not a posture of balance, but mm -hmm. long and low is the opposite imbalance from what I'm seeing in the video. Okay. Okay, so the posture he's in in the video is a posture I call extension. And what that means is the spine is pushing downward, which is really the root of the entire posture. Mm -hmm. So extension is a generic term that just refers to the movement in a joint. So in any joint in the body, like if I took my elbow, if I um, bring the bones of my elbow closer together, that's called flexion. And mm -hmm. if I straighten that joint, moving the bones apart, that's called extension. Okay. So what, what the posture of extension is referring to is the bones of the spine, which are all these little joints, right? Mm -hmm. The bottom of the spine is the scientific point of reference. So when we say the horse's back is in extension. It's also called upside down, inverted, all of all of that means the same thing. Mm -hmm. But what it means is that 
the bottom bones of the spine are coming apart, which is going to put the top bones of the spine under the saddle closer together. Okay. And when they mm -hmm. physically touch bone on bone in the extreme, which he could have that going on a little bit, although he's not showing any pain issue, but that's what kissing spine is. Okay. That's when the dorsal or the top bones of the spine start to get too close and they touch. So when we go to long and low, all we're doing is in the posture he's in, his, his, all of his spine. So the neck, when the head goes high, you'll mm -hmm. see a big bulge on the lower side of the neck, mm -hmm. right? Down low. And you can even yeah. see it from the saddle. If you look down, there's a big bulge at the bottom of yeah. the neck. That's actually the horse's cervical spine, neck bones okay. pushing okay. down. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing with the back, even if we're not aware of it, the spine is pushing downward into extension. So the neck bones are pushing down, which elevates the view. Like it, it makes the head and neck go up from our perspective, but the bones okay. of the bones of the spine or the neck are actually pushing down. So we see a big lump at the base of the neck. Okay. And, and if we take that same spinal use farther back from say the withers to the croup under the saddle, Mm -hmm. That's the th thoraco or the thoracic spine and lumbar spine is what we straddle. And those mm -hmm. are also pushing downward. Okay. And what that's going to do to the pelvis and the sacrum. So usually the lumbar, the sacrum and the pelvis kind of act as one unit. And mm -hmm. what it's doing is, and it's good where it stopped right here. Can you see okay. my cursor? Yeah. So you see this flatness across the croup. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how far behind him his hind legs are? Yes. That's a backwards disengagement of the hindquarter. Oh. Okay. So so we think of disengagement sometimes if you've been trained in disengaging a horse, we're always talking about a crossing step, a lateral mm -hmm. step of the hind legs. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is a way to disengage the hindquarters. But when they're in the posture of extension, every single stride, the hind, the pelvis is rotating more the wrong way. Oh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in engagement, the pelvic bone, if you think it's, it's kind of small, but the pelvic bone sort of runs at an angle here. Okay. Right? And yeah. basically when they're engaged, the front part of the pelvic bone is coming up and the back part's coming down when they're disengaged the front part of the pelvic bone is kind of going more downward and the back part's going upward. So what that does is it puts the hind legs so far behind the torso with every stride that they can't control their, their body weight. They can't control their stability where it's supposed to be controlled. Okay. So every single time he's working with his head in this position, in this posture, you can assume the back is down, even if you can't feel it, and mm -hmm. his hindquarters are rotating too far behind the torso. Okay. So when we talk about engagement with a horse's hindquarter, what we mean is the hind legs are stepping closer to where you are as a rider, closer yeah. to the center of the body. Yeah. So yeah. The, this posture of disengagement, if it's been going on for a while at the trot and the canter, yeah. even if he didn't have a EPM at all, even if we took that out of the equation completely, mm -hmm. it's going to weaken the hindquarters. It's going to weaken the back. It's going to allow too much concussion on the front legs, and it's going to create an uber tight short neck. Right? Okay. So just that posture will do all of that, even if we didn't have the extra factor of EPM in the mix. Okay. So he's getting sort of the double whammy, which is why at the canter, he physically fell over. Yeah. Because we're stacking one problem on top of another problem regarding how he's using his back and hindquarters. And because the posture he's in, it's an instinctual posture. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But, okay. but it's meant 
by instinct for short term fight and flight responses. Mm. Right. Okay. So, so yeah. in this posture, it does give them power, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a temporary power associated with the fight flight nervous system that isn't efficient to sustain over time. Okay. So a lot of people, even trainers, and if you look at any competition, it's like everybody lets their horse move that way because it's so easy for the horse to access power in that instinctual posture. Mm. Okay. But over the long term, it's very detrimental if that instinctual posture also becomes a habitual posture. Do you think, um, you know, do you think that this is a habit created because of the EPM? Because the way the old owner at who's owned him, who owned him since he was two, I guess, or one or two or whatever, she said he's kind of had these symptoms his whole life. So, you know, I don't know, just different things. Yes, he's tripped before. She's fallen on him before because of a trip. And I, I don't know if some of this is he's just compensated now to this point, because if you ever look at him straight on and you'll see when you come to the clinic, if you would cut him in half, he's like two different horses. He's a I huge see that. Man. And yeah. Then, you know, no, in of, fact, let me see if I can pause it while he's in frame. Oh, shoot. I missed it. Um while he's a little closer to the camera, he absolutely. So if you look at a horse's muscle development, oh, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Let me, hopefully I can hold it there. So if we drew a vertical line and, and you mm -hmm. see your balance is pretty good and I know exactly what it feels like to ride a horse like that. So you're doing a stellar job as a rider to Thank deal you. with what he's throwing at you. Yeah. But if you look like draw a vertical line, from the sky through your torso. That's very vertical and that's mm -hmm. very in line with gravity. That's okay. the most important thing I need to see in a rider. And okay. you've got it. So that's why we're not addressing you. Okay. What I see in him is in that same line. Mm -hmm. If you sort of like, if you sort of cover up the back half on the screen mm -hmm. and then you cover up the front half, you have like this beautiful big draft horse from the saddle forward and what mm -hmm. looks like a Pasifino from the saddle backwards. Yes. <laughs> Literally is two different horses, mm -hmm. right? For so sure. what yeah. muscle development, and this is kind of what I do as a trainer is just help you understand what the body is telling us, what the movement is telling us. And I took a horse he was, I think, 10 or 11 years old when I got him. He had done pre-St. George level dressage with a professional rider. Mm -hmm. I got him for free because he developed nav navicular. And oh. then they gave him away. And the next year he developed ring bone. And so mm -hmm. I took him with the pathology. But he, he was exactly the same development. Okay. Exactly the same. He never had EPM. But mm -hmm. he had zero control over his hindquarters. And when I first started riding him early on, even at the trot, if I didn't give him short, tight reins and hold up his front end, I thought we were going to fall. That's what I feel like. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like he, if I'm not supporting him, he, yeah, he's yeah. just a loose goose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what that means is his body for a long time. And this is not a judgment of anybody's riding. This is just what his body is showing us. Mm -hmm. If you've only had him since uh, like what, July 22. So you've had him two years or one year? It's so I had him since January of last year. Okay. And I rode him since September, but you know, there's probably a good six months. I, I didn't ride at all because of his condition, you know, he'd come up lame or whatever. So. Yeah. But in the short amount of time that you've had him as a 22 year old horse, mm -hmm. this is what he came with. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and part of it could have been the EPM because that's a super high number. So mm -hmm. that's been going on a while. And yeah. the other part of it is by today's standards in the horse industry, 
even if the horse successfully competed at dressage for many years, that means nothing to me regarding the balance and the correct mm -hmm. function of the horse. Because there's a lot of people winning in all kinds of sports with their horses moving in gross dysfunction. Mm. That's very okay. possible because the horse can go to this, what I'm called, what I'm saying is an instinctual use of the body and they will give you power and speed, but it, it doesn't show up in a horse until they start to have issues, maybe around the age of 10 or 12. And you're dealing with a 20 plus year old horse. That's now probably been ridden where he's had to work upside down or stabilize on his front end for many years. And he's reaching a point where he, he just, it's too taxing. He can't do it like a young horse can. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is part of what perpetuates the problem is a young horse, 10 and under is going to be able to cope with that because they have the strength and the energy. But from 10 years forward, you start to have issues because they're running out of that strength and energy of poor mechanical use of their body. Mm -hmm. That so, makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it's just like us, we don't really notice our bad functional habits till mm -hmm. we get in our 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And then it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, now we have a problem. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. it's the same with horses. But um, so he's, he, the muscle development tells you that he has been really working hard with his front end while the mm -hmm. muscles in the back and the hindquarter have not been working hard and they may have atrophied quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So the true strength of this horse is in the weakest link, yeah. which means his real strength is what you see back here. Sure. Right. So mm -hmm. that's the horse you're really working with, which is then it's not a surprise how much he struggles to go into trot and canter. Mm hmm. Because there's yeah. not, we're, we're lacking muscle strength on top of the stability he should have back there based both on the posture he works in habitually and the EPM. So mm -hmm. it's like this double whammy. And that's why I'm sure he feels like a noodle. Like, <laughs> it's, he's, yeah. It's like no other horse I've ever ridden. It's, it's incredible. And when I first got him, I thought it was, you know, everybody, I thought that's just how drafts rode. <laughs> I, yeah. It was, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. this is just how drafts ride. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's what's challenging with the draft breeds is they have a tendency, like with all drafts, it's a little tricky how you get them to actually use their back and hind quarter correctly because they're bred with so much sort of power in these necks and front ends. Mm -hmm. So it's a little tricky for all drafts. It's sort of the path of least resistance with draft breeds to just let them use that big old neck their whole life, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. it doesn't really serve them because it's not the healthiest use of their body over the long term. Yeah. So, yeah. but, it, but I get the challenge. And, mm -hmm. um, and so the other thing is when the, the horse is pushing the spine down and the pelvis is rotating backwards, what we feel as riders is we don't really feel necessarily the hole that we're sitting in. You can see here in the camera that from the saddle, it does go down a little bit. So you can visually sort of see that hole, but you really don't feel it when you ride. But what we do feel, which is what you're describing with noodley and all over the place and all this side to side dissipation of energy mm -hmm. is the side effect of the spine pushing down is that on the horse's spine, they have these long dorsal wings to the vertebra that are called okay. spinous processes. Okay. And you can almost imagine it like the rudder on a boat, but upside down. Okay. Like, you know, sorry, the, the keel of a boat. Okay. So, you oh, know, on a yeah. boat, it has that ridge underneath yeah. that kind of stabilizes yeah. the boat. Yeah. If you flip that upside down, that's the horse's spine. Okay. <laughs> so that, that keel on a horse is upside down. And when the spine pushes down, it rocks the keel. Okay. It causes a side effect that's called hyper rotation. Okay. 
So literally the whole torso is doing this. Mm -hmm. And if it does that long enough, then it also bends and rolls. Mm -hmm. So that makes his midline feel like a wet noodle. Okay. And what every horse should feel like down the midline, no matter the breed, absolutely no matter the breed, the, the spinal functions when they're in a healthy coordination should generate an absolutely straight and stable line of force from nose to tail in the horse. Okay. So it should feel like the midline of a horse is a broomstick, not a noodle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's nowhere near broomstick. No. Mm -mm. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's what will restore his body is basically when he's in long and low, mm -hmm. the only benefit of that posture is that he's no longer in extension. Okay. So he's no longer actively pushing the spine down. He's not lifting the spine, which is where we get more engagement and build more muscle in the back and hind quarter, mm -hmm. but we can't get there from here. It would yeah. be so difficult that neither one of you would likely be able to, to uh, like, it, there's so many trap doors that the horse would probably outmaneuver you. So the safer thing, especially with the EPM as part of the factor, and if you can ride him in the posture of long and low, that mm -hmm. will be where you have maximum benefit to his body. Okay. Because he's weak in the hindquarter and back, even if you mooched around and didn't steer, and it, even if it was a slow lethargic walk, because as soon as you ask for too much speed, You've basically hit your power and speed limit with him as soon as he shortens the neck. Okay. And that could be a faster walk, or if you try an upward transition, and the only way he can get into trot is shortening the neck, Yeah. then you're stepping on your own foot of progress. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, because he's always done it, and um, you so know, the I knew it wasn't good. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and some horses can change it. You can deal with a little bit of bad trot in the process of improving the balance. Mm -hmm. But in his specific case, I wouldn't think that that's going to be your path of least resistance. That would be singularly the hardest way to go about this. Okay. I think the path of least resistance for him would be groundwork or riding at the walk. You can have a very light rein. Because okay. if he stumbles and trips at the walk, you're both probably still safe. Yeah. And, and as long as he's stumbling or tripping and you're getting the EPM issue checked out, then it's a matter of what's happening with the stumbling and the tripping is he loses control over his internal body weight. And as soon as it excessively loads the front legs, he's going to trip or stumble. So mm -hmm. all that's telling you is that there's too much weight on the front legs. Okay. And that's okay. going to unfortunately have to continue. You, you're, you're building the body in a better way if he's in the posture of long and low, even though there's too much weight on the front legs. Mm -hmm. And so the walk is the safest speed for you guys to start rebuilding the back and hind quarter stability and muscle. Okay. When the horse is high-headed, like he is in the video, you mm -hmm. actually still have just as much, if not more weight on the front legs. And that's why they're pulling upward with the neck. They're pulling mm -hmm. the muscles upward because there's a boatload of weight on the front legs. We don't notice it or feel it because they're compensating muscularly. Okay. When they're in long and low, we really notice it and feel it because they're lengthening the muscles of the top line. Okay. So instead of the muscles of the top line sort of pulling up against that weight on the front legs, like in the posture of extension, you just feel what already is, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. So, so what you could do is if he's stumbling or tripping in the posture of long and low at the walk, mm -hmm. I would start asking for him to turn. 
And what okay. the, the turning will do, and you'll have to use your reins to make a turn. You mm -hmm. could turn the turns into a turn in each corner. You could cut the arena in half with four straight lines and come up quicker on your four turns. You could do a figure eight or you could do a circle. But okay. what the what the turning does, and if you can turn and try to keep his neck pretty straight in front of his back. Mm -hmm. In the turn, they place the inside hind leg a little bit deeper towards the center of the body. Okay. Yep. So if you keep the spine straight, like we're going to try to rebuild, turn that noodle into a broomstick. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep the neck straight and sort of reduce the noodle as much as you can with just your body, your reins, your seat, your legs, mm -hmm. if it's easier on a straight line, start there. If he's okay. tripping and stumbling on the straight line, then you want to take that midline, broomstick midline, or as least noodly as possible on some degree of a turn. Okay. When you take it on some degree of a turn, it encourages the legs, the way a horse should ideally turn is they move the legs, front and hind legs laterally to make a turn, but they don't mm -hmm. bend the midline. Okay. Okay. And even in traditional and competitive dressage right now, we still think straight on a circle means the inside of a horse should be bent on the line of the circle like a mm -hmm. banana. And I yep. go, you, you never want a banana on the inside of your horse. It should always feel like a straight broomstick. And if you can turn with that midline from nose to tail straight, then mm -hmm. what happens is it, it automatically places the hind leg closer to the center of the body. So in other words, you're engaging one hind leg on a turn, the inside hind leg, right? Okay. So if you do that on a figure eight, you're going to gently increase the depth of the hind leg placement towards the center, which is going to okay. start reversing that disengagement to engagement. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so that's yeah. only, only if your, your, your easiest thing to do is follow the rail in this arena keeping him in long and low as your priority of training. And you can play with speed, but never to the point that he's shortening the neck. Okay. So you just say, you can ask him the question, what can you do? Can you halt? Yeah. Can you walk? Can you walk slow? Can you walk a little faster? But as soon as he needs to shorten the neck to give you more speed, yeah. that's your speed limit. Okay. And what will happen is even over the course of one week, if you really make that, that like you don't even want his head level to his withers. You oh. want his, you want his ears below his withers. Mm, okay. That's really more ideal for what's going on with his hindquarter. Okay. So once his ears are below his withers, that's where you're going to start building up the strength of the back and hind quarter. Even so if you just okay. stay on a straight line and it can yeah. be a very loose rein. Okay. And only try circles, turns, or figure eights if he's stumbling a lot. Okay. If, if he stumbles once in a while, that's fine, you know, but if he's yeah. stumbling more and more, then try to cut the arena in half or cut the arena into a quarter. Okay. And that will make him turn more often. How, um, like how much time do you think? So right now I probably ride him four times a week and our sessions are short, um, because I do, I am worried about the tripping, but they've all kind of been in this posture so i'm sure it's not helping anything really um but he does have you know stamina so i mean like like what would you recommend for a session for us a half an hour at walk you know i usually do like um you know a five minute warm-up you know walking you know loose lunging kind of thing we stretch and then 
you know, I maybe do 15 to 20 minutes on him and then we walk again, just kind of very casual. Nothing. So, so the way you could test it out and I can explain in great detail later, but right now, without going into too much detail, the sort of pole and ears below the withers, changing the posture that dramatically and whatever you choose to do with him, the goal of training right now is not good steering or or even speed adjustments or mm-hmm. or whether or not he barely has any energy in forward motion. If he's mm-hmm. moving in a cloud of turtle dust, you're still good, right? Okay. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really that change of posture that is the work for okay. getting getting him turned around. Okay. And I look at it like if if I were, if I knew that the first five minutes I'm riding this horse, it's going to take him five or 10 minutes to get into long and low. He's going to start high headed. Then I might hand walk him or put him on a lunge line at the walk until he gets through that without me on his back. Okay. Right. So I want him to be pretty quick to be in long and low. And the fastest way there is let him choose the speed. And like I said, even if the speed feels like you're in a cloud of turtle dust, the only correction I would make is if he really stopped. And then I would just use enough leg aid or whip to say, no, no, don't stop. But he Mm -hmm. can, if you let him pick his speed, it's going to be slow, but he might be able to maintain that posture of a deep long and low if he's slow. Okay. And then I think because of what you described, he's too slow on the ground, too fast under saddle. Mm -hmm. If you get on and he can go straight into that slow, long and low with you on his back within the first minute or two, Mm -hmm. then I would skip all the groundwork and go straight to riding. Okay. Okay. If if it takes him five or 10 minutes to get out of high headed into long and low when you get on his back. Mm -hmm. then use the groundwork just enough that he is maintaining long and low in motion before you get on. Okay. Maybe for five minutes. Doesn't have to be long. So it's going to kind of depend. And once he knows you're not going to ask for trot or canter under saddle, he may instantly go to long and low as soon as you get on. Okay. And if he doesn't, then let him warm up without you on his back until he can be moving at any speed, either direction for five full minutes in, in the long and low posture. Okay. And then the benefit, because you're a good rider, if he can maintain the posture of long and low on pretty loose rein, you don't even have to steer if you don't want to, if the steering makes him lift his head up too much, then be easy on the steering. Mm-hmm. Your your straight line may look like a, you know, drunken sailor path. It's, yeah. you know, but as long as his neck is in front of his back, he's straight on the inside, even if he can't yet maintain a straight path of travel. Okay. Does that mean okay. it's more important that the, the pole is in line with his tail, which is the okay. spine being straight on the inside, trying to reduce that noodliness first? Yeah. And potentially, yeah. it doesn't really matter what path of travel you're on or at what speed. That broomstick should be there all the time. So if you're a little generous, if he kind of loses steering, go with the flow. If As long as you're not driving him for every forward step, if he's maintaining forward at any speed, you're also golden for now. Okay. And remember, the speed he's really got to choose is based on the weakest part of his body. Okay. So, so will he, do you think he'll feel, will this feel better for him? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. You will have, you will notice, number one, he may get tired. And that's the caveat of how long to ride. It, because what you're really doing at first by putting the posture of long and low as the priority of the the ride. That's the goal. Movement in long and low. What you're doing with every stride is you're building a new habit in the nervous system. 
Mm. Right. So you're taking away because he has the instinct, which is why he does it going into trot and canter. Plus, mm -hmm. he has that posture as a habit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trifecta, he's got EPM. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so that's what you're there to overcome. So okay. if he gets scared, he'll go back to high headed. If yeah. you ask him for more power or speed than he can give you from the hindquarters, then he's going to go back into high-headed, right? Okay. He may go in and out of high-headed because of the EPM. He may just get unstable yeah. in this process of change, right? Mm -hmm. But but that goal, first and foremost, what you're doing with every ride is building a stronger neural pathway for the habit of a new posture, Okay. So the yeah. more strides, the better. That's like your Fitbit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. every step counts in that posture. Yep. Okay. Because not only are you retraining the nervous system to a completely different opposite organization of movement, but you're also building muscle, changing muscle use, releasing some tight muscle and re-strengthening some weak muscles. Mm -hmm. So it's, I would say... I wouldn't even ask him to trot or canter for at least a month, but mm -hmm. I would ride him as frequently as you can for as okay. long as the two of you can hold up. Okay. Yeah. And I, no, I think I, with him. To. Yeah. He's yeah. very eager to, to do stuff. It's just, um, yeah. <laughs> It's a mess. Yeah, the, the longer the better. And probably by the time you're hitting maybe 45 minutes to an hour of solid walking in long and low, mm -hmm. I think the way you know he's hitting a level of fatigue would be that he just keeps stopping more frequently or it's taking more and more and more leg aid to get him back in the walk when he stops. Okay. And if that happens at the 30 minute mark, I would say, okay, today, just 30 minutes. If it happens at 40, 45 minutes, I'd say, okay, that's enough. But if I could get a whole hour before that happens, I would ride him until that happens. Because, okay. you know, if you're doing, say, four days a week and he has a day of rest, when you do ride him, I'd ride him until he's like, mercy, I can't go anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Because you've got a lot of work to do. So yeah. do I go over the poles then or should I not even don't even do no, poles? Mm -mm, don't do poles okay. because what the poles will do is articulate the leg movement through the leg joints, but we want the back. Oh, okay. And if okay. they're, if they're not strong through the back, when you go over poles in order to articulate the leg joints more, they have to go back into extension. Oh, okay. So it doesn't oh, help. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And even if he did the long and low over the poles, you're not really changing the spinal functions. What poles do is they just put the, the leg joints through more flexion, a greater range of motion and flexion and extension. Okay. Which is okay. fine if you have really good coordination through the spinal functions but his issue is all four of his spinal functions are pretty compromised right now mm -hmm. so we want to build up the way you know the spinal functions are getting mechanically better is less noodle more broomstick okay and that can happen surprisingly fast oh okay that that change of coordination like each ride you may feel he's making a marked improvement ride to ride to ride regarding that sense of a straight line of force through the midline. Okay. But you may feel like, and the other sign of progress will be he stays in long and low and offers more forward energy, even if it's not okay. fast forward energy. Sure. Right. Sure. Those will be the signs of progress. The signs okay. of fatigue will be, back to noodley, stopping a lot, <laughs> losing long and low. That's when you okay. go, okay, we don't want that. Yeah. What will take some time, and the reason I say at least a month of no trot or canter is you're retraining the neural pathways. That can be done quickly. You'll feel the changes pretty quickly in the forces of motion, but 
it still isn't any faster than us going to the gym to build muscle. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's what takes the time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. So you will see his hindquarter and his front end start to change shape as okay. the muscles change. But the way I look at it is the coordination is in the nervous system. Okay. Right. Yep. The, the habit of skeletal coordination, right. Takes some time, just like mm -hmm. us learning to ride a bike. We may have half of it done in our nervous system, but our skeleton isn't cooperating. Right. Yep. Yep. So that, that inner coordination of the skeleton takes a tiny bit longer and then once you have right. a better habit of coordination through the skeleton, then every time the skeleton is in good coordination, you're strengthening the neural pathway and you're building muscle. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm saying be really happy with whatever he's doing as long as he's not lifting that head above his withers. Yep. Okay. With, a, with the neck straight in front of him, even on turns and circles. Yeah, that's the other thing with the EPM. He's very hyperflex. Um, he he's very hyperflexible. Like he can touch his nose to his stomach. You know, it just he's very flexible. Um, which is something I guess part of EPM. Yes, that, that I was because yeah. by his breed, he should be one of those horses that tends to get more stiff than he gets loose. I go, there's really only two kind of horses. There's the wiggly ones and the stiff ones. <laughs> and by breed, he should be a stiff one. Mm -hmm. The wiggly ones are like Arabs and all gated horses. All gated horses are almost like genetically double jointed. <laughs> and so what he's doing is he's moving like a gated horse, but he's not a gated horse. Mm. Okay. So the advice I'm giving you is how I work with noodly horses, gated horses, which is really any horse that's been working habitually in that posture of extension yeah. is going to become a noodle. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the side effect of working in that posture. Okay. So as soon as you change the posture, even with the EPM, his breed doesn't want him to be that way. <laughs> that took some doing to make him yeah. that loose. But yeah. I think you'll find he enjoys and works with you and very rapidly more quick, more quickly than a noodly breed, like a gated horse, they take forever to get them stable, but he's probably going to stabilize and love feeling stable pretty rapidly. Like you'll start to notice a difference the first week by say the third or fourth ride. Okay. You'll wow. start to feel a bit of an improvement and it's yeah. still going to be not a quick thing to do but you'll feel changes in what he feels like to ride. That will come pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. And yeah. then it's a matter of keeping that new feeling and improving on it. You know what yeah. I mean? And not yeah. doing yeah. anything that sends him back into that old yeah. habit. Yeah. And yeah. Be because of the EPM, you really have to sort of ask him, what can we do in the posture of long and low? Mm -hmm. rather than going, let's see if we can find long and low after you're high headed. You just want to avoid any work right now that puts him back in that high headed posture. It's not going to serve you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to see how quickly he, you know, he responds and understands that the high headed isn't going to get anywhere, you know, so I'm excited mm -hmm. for that. No, and an interesting thing that I found is horses that are kind of in his condition, they don't have anything left other than mechanical efficiency, which is what I'm talking about with the coordination of the skeleton in motion is really mm -hmm. dictated through the spine. So the skull, the spine, and the pelvis in our body and the horse's body is called the axial skeleton. Mm -hmm. And if the axial skeleton, which, you know, almost self-described, it's the axis of the whole body. Okay. Right. So in order to help horses balanced, I'm always focused on the four spinal functions, which relate to how the axial skeleton coordinates. 
And when we get that part of the body <clears throat> more mechanically efficient and well coordinated, the legs take care of themselves. Okay. And yeah. and that's why right now in in this meeting, I'm just saying you need nose on the ground, long and low, in mm -hmm. motion. Okay. And nose on the ground, long and low, in motion, with you on him, mm -hmm. is the absolute best case scenario to rebuild his strength. Okay. 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 Yeah. And if you yeah. can't get it with you on him, then the next best thing is get it while nobody's on him. Yeah, on the ground. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. even if you had to do it hand walking, I would start there. You know what I mean? Oh, but yeah. if he's quick to go to long and low, at least in the walk, that actually puts you miles ahead of most of these situations I work with. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> so that balances out the EPM factor a little bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and, you know, some of that was you know, again, I just felt like, am I doing what's best for his rehab? You know, is the tripping just, be, you know, I always think his feet are too long. I, you know, I have him on religious hoof trimmings and, um, you know, I, I always tend to think it's something else, but I, you know, I do have to remember it's EPM and he's going to have this forever. It's just trying to compensate, you know, so he can, you know, be safe and I can ride him <laughs> really. No. And you even know? if let's say hypothetically, all of his issues were caused by EPM and he had mm -hmm. to be rehabbed, even if a hundred percent of all of these issues were strictly the result of the EPM load, I would monitor the load, but you can, I mean, basically the new medications like protozil is killing the protozoa. Yeah. So you're mm -hmm. lightening the load, which means yep. he can restore, you know, the spinal fluid and yeah. the spinal functions. And mm -hmm. what happens is when we're, when we have better coordination through the axial skeleton, through the spine, that's also going to increase um, spinal fluid production. It's also okay. going to help with the endocrine system and the, um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Immunity system. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, he needs all that. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and this is why it's so critical. So you can think of it like regarding the nervous system, the high headed posture is the instinctual posture of fight and flight. Mm -hmm. yep. The l nose on the ground is also sort of physiologically related because it's the posture of grazing. Mm -hmm. Related to the rest and digest nervous system. Okay. And so anytime, whether you have the posture or the fear that's triggering the fight flight nervous system in that posture, as well as a fear response, the immune system is absolutely suppressed. Hmm. It does not function. Okay. Right. So yeah. even that posture as a habit is compromising the immune system, the lymphatic system, the digestive system, the circulatory yeah. system, all of it. That's the importance yeah. of the nervous system. Yeah. So putting him physiologically in the rest and digest posture is also going to improve some of the physical autonomic functions like immunity, digestion, heart rate, respiration, all of that. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. it's, it's overall, that's how I rehab. And so if I had a horse that had that kind of load of protozoa, even if I had to start with very slow hand walking up against an arena wall, I know how important it now is to absolutely train the horse out of that high headed posture yeah. of extension mm -hmm. for his yeah. health, as well yeah. as rehabbing him as a riding horse. Mm -hmm. For sure. So yeah, that's, that that's the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And so it's good. He's getting an EPM checkup too, because if you now, if this is happening almost at the same time, mm -hmm. both will support his progress. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't wait to see his numbers and kind of see where everything's at with him too. So, yeah. yeah. All right. I have to dash. I have another lesson. Okay. Let me stop the recording here. Okay.